So I started reading, um, I guess like most people, um, five years old or something like that. And the first thing I know, the first thing I started to read was the Quran because I grew up in a Muslim society. And more or less as soon as you were potty trained, you went to Quran school. Uh, and you learned the alphabet first, and then you started to read the short surahs and so on. And so by the time I started um, government school, the colonial school as it were, which is the state school these days, uh, I could already read. Um, I remember that the, the teacher was suspicious because one of the, one of the ways in which you were um, assessed was to read the letters of the alphabet, the Roman alphabet, which there's a big poster on the blackboard. And okay, you. And then, okay, you can't get beyond A, B, C, you are not a reader. You can get as far as F, okay, you are semi-reader. And I could rattle all these things off. And the teacher was very suspicious. So he said, okay, now start from the end. <laughs> <laughs> and read backwards because he suspected that I may have memorized the alphabet. Um, so I think that reading always came very easily and I did, I did a lot of it as much as was around and was uh, available, which wasn't such a great deal. Um, and it just went on. So I read whatever. We read anything. You could get hands on um, without always um, fully, I'm sure, fully understanding what, what we were reading. I've in the past cited the example of reading uh, Anna Karenina um, in my uncle's house in Mombasa. Um, it was a battered old copy. I don't know how it came into my uncle's house. He was not a reader, so I don't know what he was doing in his house, but there was. Um, and I read this book and, you know, kind of like wept through, very moved. But I didn't know anything about that period or really very much about uh, Russia either. And I think that's what, that's what literature or writing can do. You don't have to understand it all, but it reaches you nonetheless. And then you go and say, so in times to come, then I could say, oh yeah, Anna Karenina, let me go find out. Let me try and read it again and all of these kinds of things. Um, so the reading was like that, whatever came your way. Um, detective novels, uh, Anna Karenina, encyclopedias, whatever. Why don't you speak about yourself? Your silences look suspicious, as if you have done something bad. Why shouldn't I lie, just like you told me before? Why should I not just make something up? Hamza asked, provoking him, because he knew where he was heading, and he was confident, confident of the outcome. Yes, I know I said you should just lie, but this is different. This is not something to joke about. This is not about keeping the peace and moving things along. Perhaps you think I'm being a meddlesome patriarch, interfering in the way a young woman might choose to live her life. I'm not her father or her brother, but she has lived with us since she was a child, and I have a responsibility to her. It's important that we know about you so our minds can be at rest. You don't have anywhere to live, and it is likely you will continue to live here with us. I would like you to continue to live here with us. So that too is another reason we need to know more about you. You could be anybody. Of course, I don't believe for one minute that you did something bad before you came here, or no worse than the rest of us have. But I need you to tell me that. Look me in the eye and tell me. If you tell me a lie about yourself, I'll see it in your eyes. Yes, I think the first um, idea was to think about the consequences of that conflict, which is central to the period that the novel is set in, which is the 1914-1918 war, um, as it uh, took place in our part of the world, in East Africa. In fact, most of it which was in what was then called Dojo East Africa. Um, now to Tanzania. So I knew I wanted to write about that. But I also uh, had another idea uh, about the capacity that we have as human beings, M many of us have um, the capacity that we have to uh, somehow retrieve something from traumatic events so that we're not completely defeated by trauma. 
uh, although of course the scars and so on and so forth. So I wanted a survivor of that war. So that's the Hamza figure, who arrives, uh, a wounded person arrives in this town that he used to know. So I thought that, that was kind of intriguing enough as a, way, as a, as a kind of um, a figure in a novel, you know, because then there is an exploration possible um, and it would allow a reflection on the war and also on this other idea of how it is that you retrieve something from traumatic experience. And I also wanted to have a, a woman who goes through an experience which is traumatic in its own way, uh, if not exactly the war. And then a novel being a novel, I wanted to bring these two together and through their encounter, they would uh, both um, kind of enable uh, a telling of what had occurred to, to, to them. So it's a way of kind of telling the story by making the, the people themselves speak about the experiences and also how they're able to assist each other to overcome these. So that was the shape of the novel. In fact, the very first part of the, what I, when I started writing it, is the moment that is now the third part of the novel, Hamza's arrival in the town. So I started there. But then this is, for me, this is how the writing process works. So after writing that, you think, well, look, so then where does he go? Who does he meet? And so I often find myself going back to answer those questions before I can move on. So what begins as the starting point in the writing ends up being somewhere in the middle because now there is the, the, the background, as it were, to, to bring in. And uh, yeah, so then that's where Elias and Khalifa the, uh, come into it and they become, those are the four figures in the novel that, um, so it, it, but it worked very, very uh, quickly and very easily. Uh, it was the first book I wrote, first novel I wrote um, when I didn't have any teaching to do at all. It was the first novel I worked on after retirement um, from the university. So I, I suppose it was the, the first thing I, I wrote as a full-time writer instead of a writer who's uh, writing and then dealing with other things and then writing and dealing with other things. You have great faith in your powers, Hamza said. Try me. Tell me the truth and I'll know it at once, Khalifa said, so vehemently that it wiped the smile of Hamza's face. All right, let me ask some questions and you can answer as you wish. You said you lived here many years ago when you were quite young. Tell me how that came about. That's not a question, Hamza said, not yet able to give up the provoking tone. Don't be irritating. I know it's not a question. All right. How did you come to live in this town when you were young? Khalifa asked irritably, not at all amused by Hamza's playfulness. My father gave me away to a merchant to cover his debts, Hamza said. I didn't know that was what he had done until after the merchant took me with him. So I don't know what my father owed or why it was necessary for him to give me away. Maybe the merchant was punishing my father for being a bad debtor. The merchant lived in this town and he brought me here to work in his shop, although he was not a shopkeeper. The shop was only a small part of his business, which was the caravan trade. He was like your merchant pirate, Amir Biashara. He did all kinds of business. He took me on one of his trips to the interior, which lasted several months. It was incredible. We went all the way to the lakes and beyond, to the mountains on the other side. Why is it that, there is, uh, that the focus of the novel is on the, on the figures, as it were, these figures that I've mentioned, rather than on the, the larger conflict of the war? And uh, so one of the reasons for doing that is uh, to say that uh, this war, although it was happening more or less um, a few hundred miles or so, most of it from the coast, which is where most of these people are, was both, in a sense, incomprehensible uh, and very far. Uh, so it was understood for a lot of people as stories of events that were happening, that were, were almost unbelievable um, for people on the coast, not for people in the 
more, more or less immediate interior. But even for the people on the coast, it affected on them. It affected them to some extent, not to the same extent. It was only the early stages of the war that the, that the, the conflict as well was on the coast, because after that, the, the Schutztruppe, the German troops, retreated and kept retreating back, back into the mainland and so on. So it was all the time moving away. But I think it's also to say what's going on, that uh, people did not really understand what, uh, or even if they understood, they knew it was a conflict between two European powers, but didn't understand what it was all about, aside from just a war uh, without purpose or meaning. Um, and the other thing is that, of course, the European point of view on such historical moments is the one that is most familiar. Uh, because because um, that's how he goes. Victors tell the stories. Um, and um, this, this uh, angle, as it were, on that, uh, on that conflict has not been written about in fiction, anyway. Of course, it's been written about by historians and by scholars and even by one or two um, memoirists in a brief way you know, recollections kind of thing. Uh, but, the, but almost all the um, writing that exists, that I could find anyway, is by um, participants who are on both sides, either the British or, or the German, um, indeed also Belgians, but not by uh, those who are, um, you know, like the Africans or the people who are, in some respects, the victims of this going on. That's a pretty good reason to write a novel about it. What was his name? Khalifa asked. We called him Uncle Hashim, but he was not my uncle, Hamza said. Khalifa thought for a moment and then nodded. Hashim Abu Bakr, I know who you mean. So you work for him. What happened to you? I didn't work for him. I was bonded to him to secure my father's debts or something like that. The merchant did not explain anything or pay me. He, he treated me like I was his property. Is there good and bad in people? Yes, I think that's how we are. Uh, they're not, uh, in, in this novel, the, um, the I suppose the, the figures whose sympathies we are drawn to uh, have their own problems. Um, and uh, certainly not heroic in any kind of uh, straightforward, um, you know, mythic sense. But they are heroic in that way that I've described of somehow being uh, uh, resolute and enduring. Um, that's the kind of heroism that I admire. The other kind of heroism doesn't need admiration from me. You know, they've got the whole world to admire them for their power and their money and their whatever. It's the little people who uh, somehow or the other overcome things. They're the ones I'm interested in. And also the people that might uh, be uh, on first appearances, uh, the oppressors and cruelties are themselves divided. I'm interested in that division that uh, power also has within it. So both the powerful and the powerless have their own limits. And it's important in order to, I think, in order to understand them as human beings, to know that. They sat silently for a while, each absorbed in his own thoughts. What happened to you? Khalifa asked again. I could not bear to live like that anymore. So I ran away to the war, Hamza said. Like Ilyas. Khalifa said disdainfully. Yes, like Ilyas. After the war, I went to the town where I had lived as a child with my parents, but they were no longer there, and no one knew where they had gone. The merchant who took me away from them, Uncle Hashim, told me that several years before I ran away. He told me that they no longer lived there, but I wanted to be sure. For a long time, I did not want to find them. I thought they had thrown me away and did not want me. Then after the war, I tried to find them, but I couldn't. So I don't have any people to tell you about. I've lost them. 
I lost them when I was very young, and I don't know what I can tell you about them that will be of any use to a grown-up person who feels a responsibility for another person. You want me to tell you about myself as if I have a complete story, but all I have are fragments which are snagged by troubling gaps, things I would have asked about if I could, moments that ended too soon or were inconclusive. Well, I guess the most obvious difference between history and literature is the, um, the language in which it delivers itself. Um, of course, um, for uh, a historian to, to um, have credibility amongst his or her peers, there are certain obvious things that have to be present in that text that he or she might be producing. Mm -hmm. Evidence, archival, uh, you know, uh, citations, etc. Possibly acknowledging the work of others who've preceded um, that research and so on. In a way, um, it has to be a kind of restrained and circumspect account. Um, a work of the imagination, like an, a fiction or a novel, might know the same things that the historian has come up with. But it, I think the work of the imagination or writing fiction, uh, there is uh, then a latitude to, to, well, to imagine what it might have been like to do this or to be present at that or whatever. And what that does, it was, of course, liberating as a, as a process of uh, writing, or is liberating in a different way. It's liberating because uh, it allows more speculation and it allows uh, the possibility, I think, of uh, humanizing those events and making them, um, making the account perhaps skeptical at times about whether this is how it might have happened or not, which is a kind of skepticism which the historian may not be able to indulge in without evidence, but a novelist can. But I think most importantly, what, uh, they work together, these two kinds of uh, narratives or these two kinds of discursive uh, accounts, um, but they're also quite different. But they work together, they're not in opposition. Uh, I often find that um, if, uh, after reading a novel, I want to find out more details which the novel cannot give me because it wouldn't work to have those kinds of details in a novel. You know, you, you, you require as a reader, I think, to be engaged in a different way uh, as you're reading. Uh, but I think that there's this, I don't know enough about that dimensional thing. Is it true? And I need to find out a bit more. Or oh, indeed, I just need to find out a bit more. 1864, the Circassians were destroyed by the Russian Empire under Catherine the Great. No, it can't be asked, Catherine the Great. Another Russian emperor. And I think, well, I, don't, I didn't know anything about that. Let me go find out. But I might have just picked that up in a brief account in a novel. So in this respect, they work together. They both bring news. They both tell us things we don't know. Or indeed, tell us more about things we already know but they do it in different ways. So I'm, I don't know, they're fine. I, at some point I think I might have liked to have been a historian, but I'm very glad I'm a novelist. There's a question about uh, what it means to say our part of the world. Um, I guess what it implies is uh, my home. And I think of home as a very, um, not very, but okay, as a, as a complicated, uh, concept. Uh, it doesn't mean that that's the place where you feel your greatest obligation to. Uh, it doesn't mean that's where you're born. Oh, nor does it mean this is where you live and work. But rather, it means all of those things. Um, so in that respect, it's not at all hard to understand that people might have multiple ideas of what home is especially people who've moved and who, uh, who are dislocated, which doesn't necessarily mean that it's something painful, uh, that it's, it is quite possible to be speaking uh, of England for me as home uh, and also 
Zanzibar as home. Uh, those are the two places, really. But I think, and again, I've mentioned this before, and when this question has arisen, that if you were to shake me awake at three o'clock in the morning and say something like, where do you come from? I would say Zanzibar. So I think something remains when places are part of us, you know. In a way, it might, must be to do with when it is that you leave those places, that, uh, that so much already remains that even though for by far the majority of my life I've lived in England, this other place doesn't go away. In fact, especially when it comes to writing, because there are good reasons for me to remember, um, because there is so much to tell in some ways, so much to work out for myself, and also so much to tell anyway about what happened there and what continues to happen there. So when I start writing, you know, <laughs> I find that I, I'm almost sooner or later, whatever, wherever I begin, I end up there. You know, because I think these are, these are the um, questions and ideas and um, that I feel a need to keep returning to, to explore, to open up again. Writing helped to um, clarify, to understand, um, because that's the result of inquiring into things, if you're lucky. You know, you come out and saying, okay, that you understand this better, which doesn't have to be, uh, as it were, a personal experience. It can also be an observed experience. You see somebody, or, or you read indeed, you don't even have to see it, about experiences that other people are going through, which have an, have an echo uh, for you from your own experience, for me anyway, from my own experience. I think the process of writing, because it's so detailed, you really can only write one word at a time. Um, and it's so detailed that you have to reassess, is that how it is? Is that how it would have been? Is this the correct word? Is this the correct way of expressing that feeling or, or that knowledge? All of those require you, therefore, to visit and revisit and you know, return and compare with other people's telling whether that telling is in conversation or the telling is from reading. And so on. so oh, clearly that kind of in-depth experience is going to make things, allow you to, uh, to, to understand things better than just fleeting impressions or as you, some, we all, all of us do this, you kind of look and think, you think, why is that happening? Oh yeah, okay. And you leave it. But if you have to write about that, what you've just observed, why somebody cycles past you and looks at you and you think, why is this person looking at me in such an angry way? Oh well, never mind, and on you go. But if you are writing about that moment, then you can't leave it like that. You have to understand it. What could it be? Could it be something to do with the way I'm dressed? Could it be something to do with my complexion? Could it be to do with him? And nothing to do with me at all. Um, is it? hard to cycle in this weather, all sorts of things like that, you know, that you would have to... So for sure, writing forces you into clarity. I, I mentioned earlier, I think it is something that I most admire about um, human nature. I'm not sure if that's the right phrase, but, but about, about us as humans, that is this ability to retrieve something from bad experiences. and. There, there is the everyday way in which people can do this, um, but there is also the way when catastrophes happen. Uh, and I think in, in our moment, as it were, the most obvious example of this are people who are um, fleeing for their lives, literally. Their cities are being bombed and destroyed, both in the Middle East and now in the Ukraine, and elsewhere, different parts of the world. Uh, and um, also people who are um, fleeing from uh, deprivation and hunger um, and um, this desire, both these desires. One desire is um, just to live. As soon as people are given an opportunity, remarkably, we see that they prosper. 
they find work or they start work, they send their children to school, they contribute to wherever it is where opportunity is made available, almost. No doubt there are some who don't, but on the whole. And uh, the people who are trying to escape deprivation, somehow this seems immoral to some people, but I don't see why. And the other thing to remember in that case is that they too don't come empty-handed. They don't come without skills. It might be those skills are in playing football, as we see so many of them do so well, but those skills may also be their youth, their energy, their desire to contribute, to, to make something of their lives, and therefore to, to be part of wherever it is they end up. And in any case, we know very well that this form of movement is just part of the whole history of humanity. It's just that the difference now is that these people are coming from that part of the world. Whereas if you just go back 100, 150 years ago, millions left Europe to go to other parts of the world. And in many, many cases, they didn't just go. They displaced people in those parts of the world, removed them, took over their, took their lives in some cases, in many cases. I don't think these guys are after that. They're after prosperity and peace and somewhere to live and contribute and so on. There are so many uh, dimensions to uh, the way societies work, particularly when they, there is a history of um, either hostility or oppression uh, and so on. Uh, and there are so many different actors in this. There is a, a need to understand, which a, a writer can contribute to in, uh, by simply writing about these things in a way that opens up a subject. There is scholarship, there are politicians, the ordinary people, if you know but I'm, what I mean by ordinary, everybody has a job, everybody's doing something. Uh, but, uh, but maybe they don't, they don't always have a public space in which they do their thinking or their speaking in the way the writers or scholars or politicians do. Everybody makes a contribution and it does seem to me that um, the contribution is generally progressive. We have in our midst, though, people who are hungry for power, for um, influence, perhaps for riches, and, and there is, uh, within human culture and human society, a constant pressure, it seems to me, between the selfishness of those seeking um, power and self-aggrandizement of one kind or another, and the majority, probably, of people who do want, on the whole, to make things better. Uh, and I like to think that the progress is in, in the direction of progress, rather than in the direction of, you know, the powerful uh, or the... I mean, of course, we always have the Putins of this world, uh, or we always have our own homegrown dictators in, in Africa, like in Niger, who've just stepped in and elsewhere of course but I do believe yes that people the human society is moving forward on the whole all the time but then every now and again we get a different kind of eruption so there is this built-in uh, nastiness I think in in human societies which we have to be constantly uh, aware of and on guard against I think uh, a writer has an obligation to speak as uh, truthfully as they understand whatever they're speaking about. Um, so I'll be the last person to say to a writer, you have to speak up about this or that or the other. The person, the writer, has chosen to do this. And I think the best thing is to leave the writer to carry on with whatever it is that they've chosen to understand and to write about. Speaking for myself, I see that one of the things that motivates me as a writer is to speak about the world I live in and particularly if I note and see 
that there is an injustice taking place. And there's plenty of that. So if that is what makes a writer political, then that's fine. But the last thing I would want is for, for uh, somebody to tell me that I should speak about this or that or that. And I certainly don't want to tell anybody, you must speak up about refugees or you must speak up about the war in Niger or whatever. I leave everybody to speak about things that they find moving. And I think that's where we should leave it.